Reporter Herman Helms described him as a little shrimp of a man with a sad and somewhat apologetic look on his face, no hair to speak of on his head, and a voice as faint as a whisper. Despite his unassuming appearance, he had a secret formula for producing world boxing champions, most notably heavyweight legend Rocky Marciano. It was said that Marciano had two things going for him, determination and... Charlie Goldman was born Israel Goldman on December 22, 1887 in Warsaw, Poland. His parents moved to the United States when he was two years old, and he grew up in the Red Hook section of Brooklyn. His education went as far as the fourth grade when one day the teacher hit him, and Charlie hit back. He ran out of the classroom and never returned. The sport of boxing then became his refuge. He learned how to fight because he wasn't a very fast runner, and he also wanted to defend his brother, Sam. Featherweight champion Terry McGovern grew up on the same street as Goldman, and the young man idolized the fighter. He was my hero, Goldman said. Terry parted his hair in the middle, so I parted mine that way too. Goldman also copied McGovern's style of dressing. Wherever McGovern wore a derby hat, Goldman would do the same. McGovern also taught Goldman how to box, and soon every kid who joined the gym had to spar with Goldman as an initiation into the sport. Goldman then started fighting in smokers, clubs where he had to apply for membership before being allowed to fight. This practice took advantage of a loophole in New York law that prohibited prize fighting, but permitted fights among club members in private venues. These events lacked medical examinations, doctors, and official commissions. Knockouts weren't recognized. The victim was revived and sent back out again. Goldman received $5 per fight, and if he fought early enough on the card, he'd go to another smoker to fight again and receive another five dollars. Goldman then barnstormed around Canada and officially turned professional at the age of 16. Standing at five feet tall and weighing only 105 pounds, fans joked that he could be mistaken for one of Snow White's dwarves. In his debut, he fought 42 rounds with young Gardner. The fight was held in a room adjoining the rear of a saloon and without the usual subterfuge of two club members fighting as an exhibition. After the fight was declared a draw, Police broke in and everyone rushed toward the exits, but Goldman was never paid the money he was owed by the promoter, who left before the cops arrived. I think he was the one who tipped them off, Goldman later said. Goldman later had an unprecedented rivalry with George Kitson, but it is unknown how many times the duo actually fought. Goldman claimed to have fought Kitson twice on the same day and 12 times in 12 days. The belief is that the two fought at least 60 times and fans never grew tired of watching their technical contests. In November of 1912, Goldman received his one and only title shot going up against bantamweight champion Johnny Cologne. He earned his biggest purse to date, $900, but in those days, there were no decisions unless a man was knocked out. The fight went the distance, with some newspapers calling Cologne the winner, while others called it a draw. In 1914, he started training fighters, but didn't retire from his own boxing career until 1918, as he complained that his hands hurt him more than his opponents. One reporter described Goldman's hands as being broken so often that they resembled twisted tree roots with the mumps. Goldman stated that he had over 500 prize fights. When asked why his face didn't look battered, Goldman replied, Because I was hardened already by those kid fights. That's one reason why boxers are a lot softer now. We grew up differently in my day. Everything was tougher. The first fighter Goldman trained was Al McCoy, a southpaw who challenged George Chip for the middleweight title in 1914. I feared that McCoy would take a terrible beating from Chip, Goldman said. So I told him to go out and swing his first punch with all his might, whether he hit Chip or not. I reasoned that, by so doing, he might throw a little caution into the champion that would take Chip a round or two to get over that, and since McCoy was a southpaw, it might take Chip another round or two to solve the style. So I thought he would be saved the beating for all those rounds. Instead, he walked out, punched Chip in the body with a right hand, swept up a left from the floor, hit the champion on the chin, and knocked him out. Goldman also had a number of sayings that he often repeated to his fighters. Axioms like, always finish with a left hook because that leaves you set to start another series of punches. Another was, don't be a hero if you get knocked down, take a count. Other quotes related to doings outside the ring, like, 
Don't buy nothing on the street, especially diamonds. And don't say you'd like to be back in the good old days. What you want is your youth. If you went back, you'd be nauseated. Goldman was referring to the old days when they used to stop a cut with Monsell's powder. It had a cement base, Goldman said. It all had to be scraped out with a knife before the cut could be stitched. By the 1920s, Goldman teamed up with Al Weil to manage a pinball arcade in Coney Island. When Weil went into managing fighters, he'd send Goldman his latest prospects. The trainer soon had a stable of world champions that included Joey Archibald, Lou Ambers, and Marty Servo. But it was in the winter of 1947 that Goldman met the fighter who would change his fortunes forever. The boxer hitched a ride on a vegetable truck to save money as he traveled from Brockton, Massachusetts to a New York street corner where he met Goldman. You look worse than the cabbages, were the first words Goldman said to Rocky Marciano. And the criticisms didn't stop there. He's 24, Goldman told Al Weil. That's kind of old. I like them young so they can learn my way. Goldman put Marciano in with one of his fighters and wasn't impressed. He just stood there with his hands by his sides and let the other guy pound on him, Goldman said. I called Weil and told him to save his money. The kid was no good. Luckily, Goldman gave Marciano another chance and saw improvement after just a few lessons. He had what I always called the equalizer, Goldman said. He could punch and he could hurt you even when he missed. He'd land punches to the arms or the shoulders and they'd punish a man like another fighter hitting to the belly or jaw. Goldman believed that a trainer should not interfere with a fighter's natural style, but rather refine and improve it. Accordingly, he did not try to turn him into a slick jabbing boxer. He sought to turn Marciano's shortcomings into advantages. His adage was, quote, if you got a tall fighter, make him taller. If you got a short fighter, make him shorter. To control Rocky's stance, Goldman tied a rope around each of Marciano's ankles so that he could only move his feet 20 inches. He taught Marciano to fight from a crouch, rolling his shoulders to get inside opponents who had a longer reach while utilizing his own leverage. Goldman placed a towel around Marciano's neck and made Rocky hold an end of the towel in each fist. Now your arms are in the proper position to punch, Goldman said. The closer your elbows are to your body, the more power you can put into a punch. It's called leverage. The duo trained for hours on end, and the teachings worked. Goldman even got Marciano an eye-exercising device, having Rocky lie down with his head motionless as he followed a pendulum with his eyes. The theory was that it would help him have stronger eyeballs than his opponent. Under Goldman's guidance, Marciano won 41 straight fights before taking on Harry Kidd Matthews in a world heavyweight title eliminator. The matchup worried Goldman, as Marciano had become overly reliant on his right hand, which he nicknamed Susie Q. This guy you're going to fight next, Kid Matthews, he's a cutie, Goldman said. You're going to need your left hand. Goldman worked on developing Marciano's left hook, sweating through session after session for two months, rehearsing attack sequences to use against Matthews. Matthew's strategy is to box Marciano, keep him at a distance, and when Rocky comes in, hold him and tie him up. Matthews is down, two lightning fast left hooks. He's badly hurt, he can't make it. 
see Marciano's terrific punching power in slow motion in just a moment. Goldman danced in the corner after the knockout. One reporter described it as the night when the pupil finally discovered what the teacher was talking about. Goldman had rigid rules for his fighters. They weren't allowed to smoke or drink. They had to work at being fighters all the time. Also, women were as taboo as cigarettes and booze. Protect your honor at all times, Goldman warned. Goldman himself didn't exactly practice what he preached. He enjoyed an occasional cigar. He claimed to be a bachelor, happy to go through life, quote, a la carte, but was often seen in the company with women significantly younger than himself. With a wink and a nod, he introduced them as his nieces and cousins. But Goldman recommended bachelorhood for everyone connected with the fight game. Rocky Marciano did only one thing of which Charlie disapproved, and that is when he got married. I was grateful to Rocky because he never undid outside the gym what we built inside, Goldman said. He kept in shape between fights. I'll always remember when he came out for the 15th round in the first Ezra Charles fight. It was like the first round. Rocky was unstoppable. Goldman's work in Marciano's corner didn't end with his instruction. He was also a noted cut man, mending and patching up his fighters faster than a doctor. He had invented his own coagulant to stop bleeding, a concoction of egg whites, vinegar, and turpentine. He kept this ointment in a pouch pinned to the front of his sweater. Goldman used this mixture to save Marciano several times, but the toughest assignment was keeping Marciano going in his second bout with Ezra Charles. Marciano's nose was split open, and the fight was in danger of being stopped. In the corner, Freddie Brown told me it's only a little nosebleed. Don't worry about it. But then they put enough gauze around my nose to bandage an army. Look at this. I look like Pinocchio. Whatever I got, Charles loves it. He's shooting straight for the nose, and he looks stronger than he has in a couple of rounds. The gauze is gone, and I'm bleeding again. But they told me it was just a nosebleed, so I gotta take their word. Forget the blood. Let's get this guy. What's Burl looking at me for? There, that right shook him good. Brown told me the truth. I can't stop the blood. The cut's bad. And if he says he can't do anything, then it must be murder. You got to get this guy right now, Columbo says. They may have to stop the fight. It's that bad. Your nose is split in half. Not worried about my nose. I'm worried about losing the title. Come on, knock this guy dead with a shot. me up. Get off me, Charles. Get out of here. Good right hand. Throw more. Get him with that right. so he can't get set to punch. Great. Let's go. 
get him. Don't let him hold. Push him off. Shove the guy. There. That should do it. Al Weil is screaming at me from the corner. What's he gonna tell me now? To knock the guy out? Leave me alone, will you? It's over. In slow motion, let's see how I finally got Charles out of there. Believe me, it took some doing. This guy came with a steel chin. There's the big right. Terrific left. Right. Just missed the left. Right on the top of his head. The left, and he goes. I knew he wouldn't be able to get up. He surprised me by trying the way he did. I thought I'd really put the guy away right here. There's Freddie Brown holding me and trying to work on my nose. It was so bad, a great corner man like Freddie couldn't do much with it. They certainly would have had to stop the fight if I didn't get Ezard right away like they told me to. I got off lucky tonight. After Marciano's retirement, Goldman struggled to find a new champion. He had trained numerous contenders over the years like Walter Cartier, Chico Vajar, and Cesar Brion, but his main focus soon became Herman Rory Calhoun, an undefeated middleweight with the upper body of a heavyweight. Goldman hoped to score an impossible double in leading Calhoun to the middleweight crown. <laughs> By 1957, Goldman felt Calhoun was ready for a title shot. All he needs is a shave and a haircut and he's ready, the trainer said. He lamented the fact that champions Sugar Ray Robinson and Carmen Basilio were allowed to tie up both the middleweight and welterweight divisions. Calhoun would knock out Basilio, Goldman said. And I have more news for you. Calhoun would tear Robinson apart. But by March of 1959, Goldman gave up on Calhoun, leaving him to train Detroit welterweight Mickey Crawford. The way I had to coach Calhoun, Goldman said, I had to make him think that all the ideas I gave him were his, not mine. Calhoun had begun to score so many impressive knockouts that he figured he didn't have to heed Goldman's advice. When they don't listen, you can't help them, Goldman said. He won't last too much longer. Goldman's words were prophetic as Calhoun quickly began losing more than he'd win, drifting out of the sport less than three years after the split with the old trainer. Goldman then became a hired hand to salvage the careers of former hopefuls and reclamation projects. Fighters like Hurricane Jackson, Tony Alonji, 
Yvonne Durrell, Tom McNeely, Toxie Hall, and Oscar Bonavena all came under his guidance but fell short. I take these big, awkward guys and I give them hell, Goldman said. Just because we took Rocky and made him a champ, everybody expects miracles. Everybody expects me to take wood and turn it into paper. His last project was the 300-pound Buster Mathis, but Goldman's age and failing health forced him to step away from the sport. Like many old trainers, he criticized the current state of boxing. When asked for his thoughts on the Floyd Patterson Ingemar Johansson series, Goldman stated that Marciano could knock them both out on the same night. Nobody trained as hard or worked to become a success as Marciano, Goldman said. Some boys just wouldn't go through what Rocky did. I never tried to change him too much. He had his own way of fighting and great courage. I concentrated on getting him to develop a left hook, and Rocky did the rest. I never knew a boy to train more faithfully. Goldman was also puzzled by the lack of fighters who had cauliflower ears. Cauliflower ears have gone out of boxing, Goldman said. In my day, we never trained with head protectors. We went into fights with bruised ears, and after a few good punches, our ears would sprout out. Nowadays, if your ear is swollen, they stop the fight. Ah, well, everything changes. Everything goes sooner or later, and everybody goes too. Goldman passed away on November 11, 1968, due to a heart attack. His death received only a small paragraph in the back of the sports section. Three days after his passing, Cy Burick wrote, quote, Charlie Goldman deserved a better send-off. He was such a sweet and decent little man in the toughest sports racket ever invented.